Welcome. Good afternoon, Club 17. We've got a great program today. I know you're looking forward to it, so am I. And we're going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now Steve Rogers is going to lead us in the invocation and four-way test. Thank you, President Bratt. Please bow your head. The fisherman's prayer. We pray that we may live to fish until our dying day. And when it comes to our last cast, we then most humbly pray, when in the Lord's great landing net and peacefully asleep, that in God's mercy, we be judged big enough to keep. Amen. <laughs> now for the four-way test of the things we think, say, and do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you. So we have a number of people visiting with us today. I want to welcome in particular right now our prospective members. And as I say your name, if you could please just stand up. Um, Karen Schuster Webb, who's a guest of Mary Brandstetter. Karen, if, if you could please stand, welcome. And I'm sure you remember that Karen addressed us actually via Zoom when we were only doing things via Zoom back in January. Thanks for speaking to us that day. And Karen is the president of the Union Institute and University. So good to see you again. And we have Jim Ryan here from US Bank. Jim is a guest of Rick Flynn. And we've got Dr. Bernie Caston here, and he's actually uh, a, my guest. Good, good to see you again, Bernie. And I've got just a few announcements today. Uh, but actually, before we get into that, we've got a couple of special things. So uh, first of all, I just want to say we've really had a number of meeting sponsors this year. My thanks to our uh, meeting sponsorship chair, Bob Brandstetter, for doing such a great job. And we're, we're very pleased today to have Wes Botto and his company, Botto Financial, as our meeting sponsor. So Wes, I'm going to turn it to you. Thank you, President Brett. First off, thank you to all of our Rotarian clients and the, the folks in this room who have referred to us, your clients, family, and friends. One thing that I love about my work is that we really enjoy every one of our clients, and you all have done a good job to keep it that way. Botto Financial Planning and Advisory is a team of independent fiduciary financial advisors. We're affiliated with one of the premier registered investment advisors, Commonwealth Financial Network, meaning we have a deep bench and breadth of resources to bring your financial life while also maintaining our second generation family business feel. Whether you are in the accumulation phase of life, trying to decide the most tax efficient way to invest, or you are nearing retirement and want to minimize Uncle Sam's take of your nest egg, it is important to have a comprehensive plan that goes beyond maximizing your rate of return on investments. We work hard alongside your existing team of tax preparers and attorneys to help you plan for life beyond the balance sheet. Let us help with your finances so that you can focus on the rest of your life. And if you'd like to have a conversation, most of you probably know how to reach me. Either email or call is great. Thank you. So Wes, thank, thanks again so much and thanks to Botto Financial for sponsoring the meeting today. And now we have an important part of our program today, and I'm going to turn things over to Galen Gordon. Galen is a co-chair of our member retention committee, and I'll let him do all of the introductions. Thank you, President Brett. Good afternoon. Everybody doing all right this afternoon? Perfect. This is an exciting time. 
So excited to see everybody back and uh, with us here at the Rotary Luncheon. And uh, for those who don't know, uh, I also work here. I'm the sales manager for the Netherland Plaza. So we're very excited to see uh, you all here this afternoon and uh, as much as you've been coming back. And so we're looking forward to the future. So that's awesome. And as looking at the future, we also want to look back to the past here really uh, briefly and then give an opportunity to recognize some of our past presidents. Now, some of these pictures I've seen for the first time, so you guys are going to have to help me out, okay? All right. Uh, look at that. It's called a Motley crew, right? <laughs> oh, my, my, my. Heads above the crowd. 1975. Oh, Dean Gordon. <laughs> Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Dean. That's awesome. Thank you so much. I was born in 76, Dean, so. Uh, but that's okay, that's okay. That's all right. Oh, here's another one, oh yeah. 83. There you go, young man, awesome. Thank you, Julian. That's perfect, and Carol's here with Julian. We appreciate you both, thank you so much. That is awesome. Oh my, wow. 83, 84, Don Nair. Thank you, Don. Appreciate you being here. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. Out on the riverboat. 91. Good looking man there, Bruce. Uh, I think Bruce might be on Zoom. Bruce is on Zoom. We appreciate you for sure. Thank you so much. There we go, kind of looks like Tom Cruise. Oh my, handsome. Oh, there he is, oh yeah, Anthony Ricciardi. Appreciate you, oh yeah. There we go, getting in the balloon, huh? Now I worked for Sipsy Klein, now you guys don't know that, but uh, it's a Remax balloon, we didn't like those plopping down in our neighborhood. 98, that's awesome. Steve, yes sir. Stephen Haver. Oh, yeah. Lumberman. Look at that, huh? There we go. Bill Henrik. Thank you, Bill. That's your father. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, yeah. Is a, a Milford man, another Milford man. There it is. What do you say, Michael Schatzman? <laughs> Milford is the best neighborhood, right, in the city, Mike? Absolutely, you believe it. Better believe it. Oh, yeah. Is this in Mount Airy? It's perfect. 06. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Owen Rassman. Thank you, Owen. Perfect. so amazing. All these are centered around service. I just love this. Somebody's getting dangerous there on a motorcycle. There you go. All right. Jay Sherman, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I've seen this face before. There we go. Uda Pepke. Thank you, Uda. Hans is here as well. Thank you, Hans, for supporting Uda. That's perfect. Great group there. Oh, there it is, yeah. Bill Shula. Nancy's here as well. Thank you so much. Perfect. Well, you're still good looking, Bill. I think he went after all these years. Awesome. Nice faces there. Oh, yeah. Carl Kappas. Kind of looks like Superman, doesn't he? Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. Awesome. 2012. There you go. Don Keller. Appreciate you, Don. Very good. 20 
Hey, 16, there it is. Look at that stash. All right, Scott, thank you so much. Very good. Oh, look at them. I like the uniforms. I don't know about the sweater. Oh, my goodness. Woo, young man, young man. All right, 2017, there he is. You all know and love Al Conscious. I believe Janice is here as well. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Janice. There it is. 18, there you are. Thank you so much, Rick Flynn. Whoa. Whoa. Costume, costume, costume. There he is. Perfect. President Dave, so good to see you back. There it is. Thank you for your service. Greatly appreciate all of our past presidents. Thank you so much. And thank you to you, Galen, for a very entertaining run through on Memory Lane. That was very good. And uh, we've got a few announcements before we get to the rest of our program. Just a reminder, once you're done eating and drinking, if you just put your mask back on, that would be great. And we have a few birthdays to celebrate this week. May 11th, Jan Rassman. May 12th, Julian Magnus. May 14th, Kathy Grader. And May 15th, Bruce Meadows and Mark Robertson. Let's wish them all a happy birthday. And I want to say a word of thanks to uh, the people, all of the club members who participated in last week's Dress for Success clothing drive. It was wonderful to see that participation uh, for a great cause. And a special thanks to the co-chairs of Women in Rotary, Julie Poyer and Allie Hubbard. <laughs> all right, time for Split the Pot. So I'm going to ask our guest speaker, Dean Regas, if he would pull a name out of this basket. Bill Stilly. And I, and I, all, all right, Bill, I'll tell you how many numbers we have today. 22. Oh, you got it. 22. Not even close. <laughs> Eight of clubs. So your, your name will go back in for the rest of May, and you're eligible, and the accumulating pot today was $741. The weekly, the weekly is $30, and that's sent out at the end of the month. So just a reminder, speaking of Bill Stilley, Bill, who chairs our Hands-On Service Committee, is heading up a project this Saturday at Camp Allen. It's a spring cleanup, or I should say really summer cleanup project, to get the camp ready for both adult and uh, young adult campers. Uh, there's an area that needs to be cleared behind uh, a deck, uh, needs to do some landscaping cleanup, need to do some painting of the deck, uh, need to do some general landscaping and cleanup around Camp Allen to get it nice and ready for when people arrive. Uh, might even be putting up some canopies and doing some mulching too. So again, it's this Saturday from 9 to 2 o'clock. You can come for any or, or all of that time to, to Camp Allen. If you haven't signed up, just let Bill Stilley know. You can catch him today. Uh, great project. And then last call, different topic for Reds Night. So a week from tomorrow night, May 21st, we've got the Centerfield Pavilion for our Rotary Club. Uh, for $95, you get your Reds ticket, you get a, a banquet or buffet dinner. We've got an indoor banquet area as well as outdoor seating. It should be a lot of fun. If you have, haven't filled out a form, there's forms here at the check-in desk that you can grab and fill one out. Tomorrow is the deadline to register or just call the office. And then members in the news, um, keep our fellow Rotarian Ken Saunders in your thoughts and prayers today as he's undergoing an appendectomy. And next week's program, we've got Elizabeth Reardon 
University of Cincinnati School of Architecture. The theme next week is Rebuilding Notre Dame Cathedral. It's going to be a great presentation. So please join us either on Zoom or in person next Thursday. And now I'd like to introduce today's speaker. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dean Regas. He's the astronomer at Cincinnati Observatory. He's been in that role since 2000. He's a well-known author, educator, and, and a popularizer, that's a good word, of astronomy. And he was the co-host from 2010 to 2019 of the PBS program Stargazers. He also has uh, written four books. He's got another one underway right now. And he has contributed to a number of astronomy magazines. As a matter of fact, for the magazine called Astronomy Magazine, he won the 2008 Out of This World Award for Astronomy Education. He's written more than 150 articles on astronomy for the Cincinnati Enquirer. He's regularly featured on television and radio. He's a frequent guest on two NPR shows, one Science Friday and the other Here and Now. He also has a podcast called Looking Up. And at the observatory, he's developed skills as a writer and as a public speaker. And he takes the complicated field of astronomy down to earth for students of all ages, including us. So we're, we're glad for that. And the book that Dean is working on right now is called How to Teach Grown-Ups About Pluto. So I, it all sounds good to me. Uh, Dean is a native of uh, Columbus, Ohio. He has lived in Cincinnati 30 years. Dean, welcome to the Rotary Club of Cincinnati. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, President Brett. Thank you so much for having me, and good to see everybody in person. This is such a treat. I don't get out very much. I get out among under the stars quite often, but it's actually great to see you all here. Um, so I've uh, been the astronomer at the observatory since 2000. Out of curiosity, how many folks have been to the observatory? Well, I figured you all would know what's cool in the, in the city to see the, uh, the observatory. Well, we're uh, slowly reopening and hopefully we'll be getting back to at least semi-normal uh, operations here soon. My job is to get people excited about the stars and looking up. And we've had so many great things that have been happening in the news lately. Uh, the landing on Mars of the rover has been big news. Uh, rockets falling from the sky, shooting stars, all sorts of stuff. And so uh, I'm here to tell you a little bit about what's the latest on Mars and a little bit about the observatory too. So this is a good chance. Since I actually get to see people in person, this means you can actually ask me questions in person too. So I know, I, well, maybe I don't know. Uh, maybe you've been, are, are there any astronomy stories that are keeping you up at night? No? Just me? That's just me? Well, uh, think of them. You have a little bit of time. If you have some spacey questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer any and all questions. I'll tell you where the aliens are. I'll tell you where the UFOs are and um, what really is at the edge of the universe. How about that? Uh, we'll leave that as the thing. Now, uh, let's see. Uh, so this is our clicker, right? What do I click? <laughs> Which one's the forward button? <laughs> Sorry. Push the green oh, the green. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. So uh, this is our talk here about on Mars, and this is the place where I work at the Cincinnati Observatory, and this is a historic landmark. It's been this building's been around since 1873, and just a gorgeous place to go into work every day. We have two gigantic telescopes, some of the oldest uh, working telescopes in the world. This is our pride and joy, a uh, 176-year-old telescope, the oldest in the Western Hemisphere, pretty much the oldest in the world you're allowed to come touch. And it's in a great working shape. We use this on clear nights, and we can also outfit it with solar filters to look at the sun safely as well. So it's just a great place to come over for a field trip, daytime or nighttime. And so you all have a personal invite over there. Anytime, come on over, just say, Dean sent you. And you come over and check out the telescope. Now, that's our older telescope. It's 176 years old. We have the new one that's only 117 years old. Uh, that one's the bigger one's about 22 feet long, weighs over 1,000 pounds. 
and also is in great working conditions. So it's just such an amazing facility. I've been around the country to other observatories, and we have such a unique spot here. Just in Hyde Park, Mount Lookout area, you turn that corner onto observatory place, and you see this beautiful building with the silver dome at the end of it. There really is nothing like it uh, in the country that I've been to. And so it's just such an amazing place to work. And I hope that we can come see you, have you, see you, have you come out there this year sometime and, and show, you the, show you what's new. Uh, so uh, like Brett mentioned, I'm an author. I've written uh, four books. My latest one is 100 Things to See in the Night Sky. And uh, they've allowed me, uh, I can uh, sell and sign some books for uh, afterwards. If you want to come see me afterwards, we'll set them up right outside the table there. And uh, so my specialty is observational astronomy, what you can see with the naked eye and minimal equipment. So anything that's up there, if you point at it, I should know what it is. That's my goal. And uh, it's just been, uh, that's, uh, I, I try to get my passion for this around to people. Uh, last night, this, I uh, got to see the crescent moon next to the planet Venus. They were in conjunction last night, and I went up to the Alt Park Pavilion. Great spot to watch the sunset. And so uh, that, that was, that's just my daily work. You know, go up and watch Venus and the, the moon together. Tonight, it's Mercury and the moon. And then in a few more days, it'll be Mars. And so there's always something going on, eclipses, all sorts of stuff. But the things that have been really in the news right lately has been Mars, and there's something about this planet that just gets people's attention. I don't know, what is it? Martians, right? That's what it is? It's gotta be the Martians. That's what everybody's interested in. Is there life on Mars? Was there life on Mars? And frankly, we don't know. There's people in the know think, well, it actually fluctuates. In the, my 20 years at the observatory, I've heard the consensus go back and forth. No way there's life on Mars. Maybe there's life on Mars. Yes, there was life on Mars. And then back to no again. And now, guess where we are? Maybe. Maybe life is on Mars and, or was on Mars. What we do know is that it was a lot more Earth-like back in its past. And it did have water on it, flowing water in the, for long periods of time. And where there's water on Earth, well, you find life. So the big question is, was there life on Mars? And we have some amazing pictures of it. This is one of the most studied planets because there's uh, satellites in orbit around it, uh, taking pictures of it for the last 20, 30 years. This is the polar ice cap on the North Pole. And we get some incredible close-up views of this. So this is a planet you know, millions of miles away from us, right now over 100 million miles away from us, and we can monitor this with such great, uh, it's just amazing to see these pictures, and it really takes you there. And so while humans can't quite go to Mars yet, it is our robotic spacecrafts that are kind of our emissaries that are getting us excited. This one is my favorite picture of Mars. This is taken as if you were in a high altitude plane flying over the surface by the North Pole. So it has a lot of uh, features uh, on, on the planet. This is the largest uh, canyon in the solar system, Valles Marineris. It's about five times deeper than the Grand Canyon and would cover about most of the United States. So for future adventurers to Mars, this would be a pretty exciting field trip to go out to the grand, grandest of canyons. This is what it would look like if you're in a balloon over top of it. And then, of course, you have the largest volcano in the solar system called Olympus Mons. All right. Let's see if you can, you're, you're following along. Olympus Mons is so big. Oh, good. Oh, I was going to say, I thought you guys know that one, right? All right, let's do that again. I, I don't think we had your attention here. So. Olympus Mons is so big. It is so big that it's three times taller than Mount Everest and would cover the entire state of Arizona. I'm glad I had a crowd that I could do that joke with. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I say that to like fifth graders and they just stare at me. They don't know what I'm talking about. Anyway, so this is a humongous feature on this planet. So there's lots of amazing places to look. So the question is, if we're going to send something to Mars, we can't see everything and explore everything at one time. We have to be very selective of where we send our rovers and where we send uh, our robotic crafts. 
And what we want to look for is places on Mars where there was water, or at least evidence of water in its past. So here's a canyon. This was most likely shaped by wind erosion, but maybe some water erosion. And so we want to try to find some places where we can land these little robots. And so these are our rovers that are on Mars currently. Uh, the little one there is called uh, Pathfinder. The one on the left is Spirit, also Opportunity. There was, those were the two rovers that came at the same time. Whoop, how do I go backwards? <laughs> yep, I got it, I got it, yep, there we go. And then the one on the right is Curiosity. That's the larger one that landed in 2012. And so the one that's that just landed now is called Perseverance, and that landed just uh, this year. And Perseverance is about the same size as Curiosity, a little bit bigger, so it's like the size of a small car. And it had a little uh, buddy on the bottom of it, they, a little helicopter, a drone that uh, was attached to the bottom of it. And that was an exciting thing. Did you see the drone launch? I mean, the, the, the technology with this is just incredible, that you know, they, to fly this thing to Mars, to land exactly where they wanted it to land, to have this, the, the rover to drive around, and then to have this automatically flying helicopter, just incredible. So here's the uh, spacecraft as it was getting ready to go. So everything is all packed up into this, uh, this nice, little uh, spacecraft. So the engineering with this is so cool. This is something they've been thinking about doing for a long, long time, and to get this all the way to Mars to work is incredible. So you can only go to Mars during these windows, but it's every 26 months where we're in the same position where we can fly to Mars. So, uh, well, did folks see the movie The Martian or read the book The Martian? Well, I mean, that's why Matt Damon had to eat all those potatoes. He couldn't get, like, people to come rescue him until 26 months later. So you can only fly there at certain times, and so you want to go when you're closer to Mars, but even still, it takes you about seven months to get there. So, for example, going to the moon for Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin took him three days, but to go to Mars would take you seven months. So that works great for rovers, not so great for humans. So we need to always go when it's close, and that's why you have these launch windows every 26 months or so. So this Perseverance uh, rover it landed, uh, had this parachute that slowed it down on its way down, and then it had a sky, sky crane that dropped it down, and then uh, finally made it to the surface. This is a, a, a kind of an ordeal, and you always see the people in NASA cheering this on as it lands. And for folks, if you didn't see the landing, uh, it, it was, uh, it's one of those things where you, you kind of watch all the uh, eggheads in NASA get very excited. And I, you know, I kind of like watching nerds get excited. I don't know what it is. I don't know why, I don't know why I'm fascinated by this, but they're in front of their computers. They can't see the rover actually land. Uh, they, they, they get a, a message from the rover basically saying, I landed. It's like on their computer, it's just like a little button that says, and they're like, we did it! And they're like, yeah, we all did it, yeah, yeah. They all do, I don't know what it is about that. Why is that so exciting to me? I don't, I don't know, I don't get it. But it, you think of it, years and years of, of, of preparation for this, you know, putting this thing together, millions of dollars to put the, all the technology to fly to another planet, and then the validation when it actually makes it there. This is probably one of the most nerve-wracking things. They call it seven minutes of terror because it's descending through the Martian atmosphere for seven minutes and there's nothing anybody can do about it. It's all automatic. If the parachutes don't open, it's over. If the retro rockets don't fire, it's over. If anything goes wrong, then it's all done. And Mars is so far away that you can't uh, get information in real time. It takes time for the message to be sent from one place to the other. So the rover landed uh, about 12 minutes before they got the signal that they actually landed, which makes uh, driving a rover not very fun <laughs> because it's not like you can uh, you know, steer in real time. So if you want to drive the rover, you have to plan ahead of time and say, okay, rover, go 10 feet forward and then stop. And then you have to wait about a half hour, and then it'll tell you, yes, I went 10 feet forward, and I want to stop. Now what? 
well, after a whole day, where are you going to go? You're going to go like 50 feet. So it's very slow going, that's for sure. Now, this is one of the pictures as the rover was descending down onto the Martian surface. So it's dropping down on this, this, this kind of crane that would lower it down very slowly. And so they attached cameras to this. So for the first time, you actually could see the landing, which was really, really cool. And this is the spot where they ended up going, a crater called Jezero Crater. And if we look at it up close, we can see something going on there in this. Is this the laser pointer? Oh, good. There he goes. So this is a, an old river valley, an old river creek bed or river bed. And right here, for any geologists out there, that looks like a delta. This is a river delta. So think of the, the bottom of the Mississippi River out by past New Orleans in the Gulf of Mexico. This is a place where a river flowed for a lot of time and deposited all this stuff. And so this looked like the perfect place to send a rover. You drive it around into this place. This is what uh, Jezero Crater looked like in the past when it did have water on it. So it landed in an old lake bed and now is driving up to the river delta. So the big question is, what is it going to find? And, well, it's starting to drive up into the delta, and it has all this, uh, these great cameras, drills, instruments to look for things. So the question is, will they find a fossil? We're at the delta, the base of a river valley. Could some stuff have deposited there? It's sedimentary rock, no doubt about it. Could there be a fossil in there? Well, nobody's really sure. It's a very dry, desolate place right now, and so anything that happened would have been in the past. But if you think about, uh, these are some more pictures from the surface of Mars from Perseverance. If you think about uh, around here, uh, this is one of the greatest geological places Cincinnati is with all our fossils. Do you remember when you were kids and you went hunting for fossils down the creek bed? Or your teachers made you go hunt fossils in the creek bed? And so the, the, these are the kind of rocks that could be at this spot. And so there could be fossils there. There also could be nothing there, but it's quite an adventure to get these kind of these pictures. And these are our, our first forays onto the planet, basically. So there's back at the, uh, the, the, the base of the river delta. So it's going to be starting to drive up that way and investigating. And these pictures are a lot uh, better than some of the ones we've had before because this takes time to develop these things. So the cameras and the technology on these rovers are not from 2021. They're from 2015 or so. Uh, and so they do have their old uh, flip phone technology maybe on these things, but you still get some pretty amazing shots. And so and they can even do a little bit of video, but that does not look like a very inviting place, does it? Mars is not exactly... Uh, our future home in a lot of ways. If that's our future home, give me Cincinnati anytime. I'll take, I'd rather have that. So here's the helicopter called Ingenuity that they dropped off on the, the bottom of, it was on the bottom of the rover and then uh, he, they dropped it down on the ground and rolled the rover away. And so there's the, uh, the selfie of the little rover checking out his little helicopter friend. You know, people at NASA have at least some sense of humor, I think. They, you know, and so they, <laughs> I like this shot. I don't know what it is. Like a proud, proud papa there looking at his little uh, helicopter. And so uh, the helicopter's done a few flights here so far. And I haven't heard the latest one if they've done one that's gone really, really far. They, the, the first ones were just kind of up and down flights. And it's all automatic. So it's not like somebody's steering these things. Uh, but... Eventually, this is, of course, if I was in charge, I would say, okay, we got to do one really big final flight. What do you say? We just fly it off into the horizon over everything. Just keep going until the batteries run out, and then it crashes where it crashes. Well, that's probably why I don't work for NASA. That's because <laughs> they, they probably wouldn't like that. They're very cautious. So, uh, so we're getting some first flights, and so this is the, the big test was, can a, uh, a drone even work on Mars? It has a very thin atmosphere. It's about 1% the atmosphere of Earth, but the gravity is a lot less. And so there was a lot of question marks, would this even fly? 
Uh, they tried to test it on Earth, but it's hard to simulate those conditions, but it all worked and uh, seems to be doing pretty good as things go. So this is our, our future hope is to maybe send humans to Mars at some point. And the time frame on this is probably the 2030s, most likely 2040s before this ever happens. There's so many things to work out before we send people to Mars. And I go back and forth whether or not I think this is a good idea. I'm kind of on the good, I think it's a good idea now kick. And the reason for that is because I've been in quarantine for a year. <laughs> and you know, if we take people and send them to Mars for a two year journey, I bet they'll be able to handle that. You know, like uh, I'm not volunteering, I'm saying, but I think it's a, it seems like a more reasonable thing now that I've been in quarantine. But the, the whole idea of sending people to Mars, it would take you uh, seven months to get there. You'd spend about one year on the planet and then seven months to get back because you gotta go through those windows every 26 months. So, every, so you could be, you'd be gone for about 26 months from Earth. Well, anybody wanna volunteer? Any volunteers here? I didn't sell it. Uh, anybody wanna volunteer somebody? <laughs> All right. Well, there's a lot of pointing going on up here at this front table. I don't know, there's a lot of recruiting going on here. Well, I, I understand that the Rotary Club is very persuasive, so uh, just just careful. There you go. The, 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 that would be... Uh, think about that. Yes, you'd be pioneers. First Rotary Club on another planet? Oh, boy, that sounds pretty good. See, this is, this is where we get the ideas from you. You guys are like the master recruiters here. This is, this is great. NASA needs, you, you got to give some tips to NASA. I think that would probably be good too. Um, but uh, the, 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 the task of going to Mars would be incredibly difficult. The isolation, the uh, weightlessness for several months. Can your body withstand it? The radiation, eating that packaged food and tang every day. The space toilets. I don't, I don't like to talk about this a lot, but kids find it fascinating, and so maybe you will too. Just, have you ever seen the space toilets on the internet? We're all done eating, right? I don't want to go into detail, but just imagine if you will, if you want, you don't have to, going to the bathroom in no gravity. Just, I'll let you imagine, that's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say, it's not fun. I, I so. <laughs> But the, uh, the other thing is to be away from Earth for that long. This is, uh, there is, uh, this is not a, a welcoming planet for us. Everything out there is, is not Earth-like. Uh, no atmosphere, no food, no water. You have to bring all that stuff with you. Um, but I do think it's an adventure we're going to do. There's, there's no doubt about it. It's one of those final frontiers sending people to this, this spot. What we make of it, I'm not exactly sure. I think it's just an adventure. It's a, it's a, it will excite people and will kind of inspire another generation, kind of like the moon landing did. Now, you know, what practical things do we get out of it? Well, adventure and lots of technology. Uh, everybody's phones really have NASA to thank for them. Maybe you don't want to thank them for your phones, but uh, the phones, uh, our communications that we have today are all because of how we communicate with astronauts, basically. So there's all these technological advances that could come from this. But the, 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 the biggest thing that I always think about when I think about tr space travel is what would be the ideal crew to go to Mars? Think you have to be all together. These are the only people you ever see for 26 months. What crew would be the best makeup for this? Now, this is something that the NASA psychologists have been thinking about for a long time. How do you put a crew together? And there are two trains of thought on this. There's two camps. And I'm not joking, but it will sound very good. One camp says that you should make all your Martian crew married couples. The other camp says that is the worst possible crew you could ever put and send to Mars ever. I will let you discuss that amongst your spouses also. I, we, you can sign up your spouse if you want. I don't know. It's up to you. I, 
but to think about that. So there is a lot of adventure with this, and we're just getting started. I can't wait to see what perseverance and ingenuity find on Mars, and you never know exactly what's going to come from this, but I think it's, it's, it's really it inspires a lot of people. And for the last year, when we've been kind of stuck at home, I've had great solace watching the stars, getting outside and just doing some stargazing, letting my adventure, my imagination go with this. And that's one, I think, the key thing with, with space travel is it really does kind of let us reach outside of ourselves and see what all is out there. And so uh, thank you very much for having me here today and talking about our other planet, Red Planet. and. Uh, I really appreciate it. Good to see people in actual person. Thank you all so much. Uh, it was a fascinating presentation, and we have time for questions and answers. So uh, I know some people have already started texting me questions who are watching on Zoom. And uh, actually, if I could borrow this microphone right here, and I'll repeat those questions. And uh, there we go. So, but let's start with a question in the room first, and I'll let you, uh, Dean, I'm going to let you take this mic back. Okay. Here we are facing climate change in, in, on Earth. It sounds like there was tremendous climate change on Mars. Does anybody think, I mean, give some thought as to what could have possibly happened on Mars that it used to have water, but now there's no water? Yeah, that's a very good, the question is, uh, what happened to Mars's climate? What happened to the change so dramatically that it lost all of its water? Because yeah, water cannot exist on the surface of Mars. It just goes right into the atmosphere. Uh, and so something very traumatic happened to the planet. And it was probably something very slow, uh, but what most scientists think is it's the, it lost its magnetic field. It's a smaller planet than Earth, so it evolved a lot faster than ours. Uh, it's, you know, it's only about half the diameter of Earth, uh, so very small planet. And so once that uh, magnetic field disappeared, the sun just sandblasted everything off of it. We're protected on Earth by our atmosphere and by our magnetic field. So those are the big things we want to keep, uh, that's for sure. Uh, there is one other thing about Mars that people talk about is that uh, this could be our, our escape hatch. This, is, this could be our second planet we could go to. And I think that is not correct. Uh, because the best day on Mars is still better, is still way worse than the worst day on Earth. There is, you could go anywhere on Earth and walk outside and not die. On Mars, there is no such place. <laughs> Everywhere you go, you walk outside, you'd be dead quick. There is the amount of th things we would have to do to Mars to make it a livable place. I, <laughs> I joke about this. I say, you know, the worst place on Earth is still better than the best place on Mars. And somebody in the audience once said, even Cleveland? I was like, yeah, 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 even Cleveland. <laughs> even Cleveland. Sorry, I had to do the dig on Cleveland. I mean, come on, we, we got to dig Cleveland every once in a while. But the, the, the amount of change we'd have to do to Mars to have anybody live on it the way we live on Earth, it's just, yeah, it, it doesn't make sense to me. So I, I, that's one of the things I, I like the adventure of going to Mars, but it is not our escape hatch. The Earth is still our place we got to figure out. I have a question from a member on Zoom, uh, I think on Zoom, Janet Burns. Do you know, uh, do they know when there was water on Mars? Yeah, that's a good question. So when was the water on Mars? We're talking, you know, hundreds of millions of years ago at the most recent. So billions of years to just about a couple hundred million years ago. So we're talking, it's been dry for a very long time. But for geologists, that's not that far. I mean, geologists think in, in billions of years. Um, so that's the big question is, was there uh, water on Mars long enough for life to come about? Uh, life on Earth took a whole long time to get going. And so was there enough stability there for that to happen? That's still the big question. Which one? So yeah, what uh, strategic advantages can we get from Mars? There's some uh, 
kind of the, the technological one is the biggest one. It, you know, this is, it's kind of not like a practical thing, like we're gonna go to Mars and bring back stuff that we can, you know, like you know, minerals or things like that. Uh, it is really basically, yeah, technological and adventurous ex exploration. That's pretty much what it is. It, it can maybe give us a little bit of insights onto how planets change over time. That's definitely something as we're talking about how, you know, what happened to Mars that we make sure it doesn't happen to Earth. Uh, but I think that's still the biggest one is the technological advantages and just because we're explorers as, as, as creatures, I think that's kind of what we, what we do. <laughs> Oh, yeah, we could talk about black holes here. <laughs> yeah, so the question is about the black hole image that came out of a couple years ago uh, with the kind of reddish, orangish stuff around it. Uh, this was a pretty incredible thing to the first black hole ever actually photographed. They've all been theoretical, and basically when astronomers look and see a black hole in their telescopes, they don't see anything. They just see stuff going around in empty space. So they're like, well, there's something there, but we can't see it because it's black and space is black. So it took these really specialized telescopes that they had to connect basically together. They were connected across the world to essentially be an even bigger telescope. And they were able to image this, this black hole that's in the center of a galaxy far, far away. And uh, in the image of it, it's not in the optical wavelength. So it's not that, yeah, you wouldn't see that if you were there. If you were close enough, uh, then you would, it would be, you would still see kind of a black circular object and there'd be lots of gases around it, but it would not be the exact one that you see with that. That I do believe was infrared wavelength, but I'm not quite sure which wavelength the light it was. But it was at least image, so it's not like they, they made it up, it, it's like they're, they're, there's a lot of enhancement going on. And a lot of people ask about this with the Hubble telescope pictures, all those beautiful colors. I hate to tell you, they use Photoshop. <laughs> I know, I know it's very disappointing. Some of those Hubble, they actually use Photoshop on their image, to, but it's to enhance them. It's not like they're artists and they're recreating stuff. They're actually showing things that are there but just not those colors. I know it's very disappointing. I, you can be very mad at me. I'm sorry. I, you, those pictures are, are awesome. So just forget I ever said that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, you want to go? Yeah, so if uh, Mars is, is not the best of places for, to go, for us to go, where else could we go? Well, that's the, the least bad option, <laughs> is Mars. <laughs> All the other options are much, much worse. Uh, so if we go to Mercury, you'll get uh, irradiated in about five seconds. If you go to Venus, you'll be uh, melted into a pile of goop. It's about 900 degrees on the planet. Everywhere else, you can't really stand, you know, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, or gas planets, you just sink into the planet. Uh, all the moons wouldn't be any good. The only other uh, candidate out there is some asteroids, is that we might send people to asteroids, uh, and that is something that they are looking into in a way of mining asteroids. I am definitely not a proponent of this because some of the cases say we need to bring the asteroids closer to Earth and then we can mine them better. 
I don't want to bring anything closer to Earth. I've seen too many movies. I saw Armageddon. I don't want to see this. We don't bring stuff closer to Earth. Let's push them away from the Earth. And, I, I, and also my economist side says, wait a second. So we're going to spend a billion dollars to build rockets to go up and get metal that's here on Earth. How is that financially reasonable? And the answer is it's not. That's why they haven't done it. If it was financially reasonable, somebody would have done it. But yeah, I don't think it's going to happen. So then if we want to look outside the solar system, that's what some of our telescopes are doing now. They're searching around other star systems looking for Earth-like planets. They're called exoplanets. And astronomers have found thousands of these planets around other stars, some of them earth size. But we can't tell right now if they're Earth-like. Like, do they have an atmosphere? Do they have water? Is it an Earth 2.0? That's still on the table to look for. But if it takes seven months to get to Mars, to go to the nearest exoplanet would take you only about 75,000 years. <laughs> only, yeah, it's no problem. <laughs> I, I, I always love telling that to school kids, too. I say, yeah, if you want to go to that star, it'll take you 75,000 years. And one of the best reactions was, I'd be dead. Yeah, yeah, you would be dead. That's true. Yeah, I, I never thought about that. Yeah, you'd be dead. Yeah. So Mars is really our only option. Uh, you know, the moon is still out there, too, as a possible base, but it, it's not something that we can turn into Earth. Like, uh, And, yeah, so it's it, the the practical matter of it is, yeah, uh, it just, you know, it makes me really appreciate Earth a lot better with all this, that's for sure. Time for one more. Okay, uh, sure, how about back there, back to the back? I saw your hand before. Ooh. That's a good question. So where's the best place to see the northern lights? Uh, so I've seen the northern lights three times in my life. Uh, once uh, was in Alberta. Uh, another time was in Newfoundland, and then the third time was at the Cincinnati Observatory. On occasion, about once every 10, once every 20 years, northern lights are visible from Cincinnati. It's very rare and hasn't happened since 2001. But if you want a better chance at it, go north. The farther north you go, the better chances are you see it. Uh, I went to Iceland. Iceland's always one of the kind of the chic places to go because it's uh, not too far of a flight for us. And, uh, uh, and I went on that Wow Air when I was there to Iceland. Did anybody go on Wow Air? That was like no frills, that's for sure. But it got me there. I got there and back before they closed. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't get stuck. But anyway, um, I went all the way there, didn't get to see the Northern Lights. Then a friend of mine went two weeks later. She did see the Northern Lights. So it's really unpredictable. The farther north you go, the better. So Alaska is great, uh, Iceland, uh, Scandinavia. And then if you go farther south, then you go to you know, the southern hemisphere too for the southern lights. But it is completely unpredictable. Um, the best place to kind of watch this is a website called spaceweather.com. They kind of update this. And they will even send you a text if there's northern lights in your area. It costs money. I haven't done it because they'll never text me. So uh, for Cincinnati, but if you go, you know, North Upper Peninsula, Michigan has better chances, and you know, Upper Peninsula, Michigan is a great place just to go for stargazing because it's so dark. You get away from the city lights also, um, and the sun is ramping up a little bit. It goes in cycles every 11 years because the northern lights are caused by stuff coming from the sun to us. And so the more solar activity, the more northern lights. So we should see more northern lights in the next couple years. Uh, but yeah, farther north, the better. That's for sure. That's great. That's great. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So great presentation and a lot of great questions. We had more questions from people on Zoom and more questions in the room. And Dean, I don't know if you have a few minutes at the end of lunch, if you'd be willing to just take any one-to-one. -one. And as you were talking, I, I know you've written four books. You've got a fifth you're working on now, and I have a title for your sixth. I'd call it The Best Day on Mars and, and see what kind of reaction you get. But very, very good. and. Um, one of the things, and Dean and I didn't have a lot of time to talk about Rotary before today's lunch, but one of the things that's true about Rotary worldwide is 
We have a focus area on fighting disease, and in honor of you speaking today, we're making a donation to the Rotary International End Polio Now campaign, showing our appreciation. Thank you so much. And, and one of our other focus areas globally is supporting education. And I don't think we could have had a better demonstration of somebody who knows how to share information, get the audience interest at any age, our age, right down to toddlers, it's fantastic. Thanks for all you've done to open opportunities for people to learn more about our universe. And we actually have a pin for you. Our theme this year is Rotary Opens Opportunities. So thank you so much for what you do to improve the lives of others. And just a, re a reminder, for the past presidents here, it's great to see so many people here. There's going to be a quick photo taken. If you could go to the stage immediately after the meeting for a quick photo, that would be wonderful. And um, just a reminder, uh, next week we've got Elizabeth Reardon from UC speaking on restoring Notre Dame Cathedral. Should be a great presentation next Thursday. In the meantime, have a great weekend. Meeting adjourned.